Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your Lenten co-host, Dean Detloff. And I'm your other Lenten co-host, Matt Bernico. That's right, folks. It's Lent once again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like we've earned a year off Lent. Yeah, honestly. it feels that way. Uh, it's, it seems like this is, the, this is year three of the pandemic, and I feel like we've been in sort of a Lenten mode this mm-hmm. entire time. One big, long Lent that hasn't quite stopped. And, you know, actually, like, the lockdowns and everything, they kind of coincided with Lent the first time around. So it is just one big global Lent, huh? Yeah, that's true. Man, I remember uh, during the first lockdowns, people, people were like, uh, people, I mean, right-wing politicians, <laughs> We're like, we're going to make sure things are back to normal by yeah, Easter. Yeah. And our society did not rise in deep. They didn't say which Easter. <laughs> That's right. Three re- Easter's from now, we're going to be back in church. <laughs> with One for on. each day Jesus was in hell. <laughs> wow. Well, that that's a bummer. Like always, we're starting this podcast <laughs> off at a real low. But that just means that you know that we can just, there's only up. That's right. Here, so that's cool. Um, okay. So you might remember... Um, a few months ago, we were in Advent, another great liturgical time of the year, and we decided that we were going to structure our episodes around the big themes of Advent, and we did that. We talked about hope, peace, joy, love, all of the good ones, all of your faves. <laughs> now it's Lent, and we're going to do the same thing with Lent. Um, I guess the the problem here, the one hiccup, is that <laughs> the themes of Lent are not like as nice and feel <laughs> feel good as uh, Advent. Um, instead of hope, we got fasting. <laughs> instead of joy, we got repentance. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's not a great, it's not a one-for-one one comparison, but um, we're going to take some time uh, out of our busy podcasting schedule and uh, talk through some of the big themes of Lent. We're even going to have some guests on, at least one guest for sure. So that's something cool. Yeah, we've been that in a long time. I mean, I feel like uh, Advent yeah. is the chuggy season. Um, it's when you can get mm-hmm, all your mm-hmm. big, chunky, bad decorations, get them out there, and everybody loves them. Uh, Lent is the goth season, so we got to bring that kind of energy here, I think. Man, someone else was just telling me that this evening, that Lent is sort of goth. And I, I, I vibe with that. That sounds good to me. So... Um, just like we did during Advent, we're going to pick up some of the big themes, fasting, almsgiving, repentance, simplicity, maybe not those exactly, but, you know, orbiting around those ideas. And we're going to think through what they might mean politically, because that's what we do on this podcast, um, forsaking the individual spiritual because it's too because <laughs> it's, it's too ruined by our evangelical past or, be, or at least in my case, that's the that's that's what's happening. Uh, and we're going to think about what's happening uh, with regards to these ideas or sort of structurally or politically. And uh, I don't know. I think it'll be a good exercise, if nothing else, for our brains. And that is the kind of exercise I like to do. When people think about Lent, they think about probably one thing in particular. That is, during Lent, Christians give something up. Uh, Dean, what are you giving up for Lent? You know, I am not giving anything up. That's a big twist. Uh, This year, in (laughs) fact, instead, I'm going to add something to my life. Um, So I have been trying to cultivate a more active prayer life in my life. Um, Not very good at it. (laughs) Don't like to do it. Um, And so this year for Lent, I'm seeking out uh, prayers, especially from kind of the liberation theology tradition. But things to kind of connect me a little bit more personally and intentionally with my spiritual life um, at the end of the day before I go to sleep. Um, That is usually when I have some alone time. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to write some letters once a week to people that are important to me. That's my Lenten practice. It's too hard. (laughs) Life's too hard to give anything up right now. That's how I feel. (laughs) Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, Things are very difficult. Um, It's just a horrible time to be alive. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in general, I mean, it's not all bad, but I'm I'm with you. I couldn't possibly give something up right now. I feel like if I, I everything I'm doing is just really the bear. I need to stay kind yeah. of like a, a an okay sane. It's person. like I don't um, eat meat. I don't eat sweets. I don't like chocolate and whatever else. Like what? It, what else is there? Video it's a great games? Question. What else Doubt is there? It. No, no. I mean, like if you <laughs> video games are not the most important thing in the world, but at the same time, um, right now, I think everyone needs a nice distraction and video games are one of them. So don't give those up. I mean, whatever you, you do you out there listener. I'm just telling you Dean personally, right, right, don't right, do right. that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, pastor father, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm also not giving anything up. I don't think I gave anything up last year. Um, but like 
yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm adding um, that I'm going to go do – our church is having a Wednesday night Lent situation. <laughs> is that um, what they call it <laughs> on the that's posters? What, that's what – that's what it says in the branding. Yeah. I kept telling their, our priest, hey, man, don't call it a situation. That's really bizarre. And he said, no, sorry. That's that's the Anglo-Catholic it's way. Just a, it's a Lenten situation. It's just a Lenten meet and greet with that one guy from Jersey Shore. That's right. Leading a Bible study. <laughs> that's right. He's a he's Episcopalian, the situation, if you didn't know that. Um, anyways, I decided I'm going to do that with my family. And um, I think that's as much as I can handle right now, honestly. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know if I could add another thing. You know, to my when life. I went to an Episcopal church for a little bit, uh, they had a Wednesday night soup night, which I guess is probably hard to do during COVID. But it was actually very cool. Um, I feel like the funny thing about Lent is it's supposed to be kind of simple and you know not getting uh, too wild. But <laughs> this was not really like that. It was like everybody bringing the best soup they could think of, <laughs> and somehow oh, that because soup is like a simple food or whatever, we all convinced ourselves that was a good Lenten thing to do. But yeah, what a great Wednesday idea. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we're having a, at our Wednesday night Episcopalian situation, we are having uh, <laughs> pasta. We're, it's it's pasta every week, so that's something kind of crazy. <laughs> Wednesday night Episcopalian situation, by the way, is such a great name for your <laughs> Christian synth pop band. Yeah, I think so. Um, we're doing Christian covers of Vampire Weekend songs, and <laughs> the, it's out of control. The apologetics for synth pop is a very good <laughs> idea. That's going to be in Righteous Gemstones at some point. Yeah. Yep. I think uh, when they when inevitably it happens, we're going to have to write them and tell them sorry. We did come with this idea. Yeah, first. we are litigious. <laughs> that's that's very true. You know, I was thinking about this a little bit. Um, I was explaining what Lent was to my son, who is seven, and I don't. I didn't do a great job. Honestly, I was trying to tell him that people give things up during Lent. And he was like, well, what are we going to give up during Lent? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to just <laughs> do something different. Um, anyways, it made me think about the first time I learned what Lent was. Because uh, growing up in, in an evangelical household, an evangelical church, Lent was not something we practiced in sort of a real way. Like not in the not in the way that Catholics or most mainline Christians do. Um, I remember the moment I figured out what Lent was and I was like, man, I don't know. I was in grade school for sure in elementary school and we were on a field trip and this girl in my class was Catholic for sure because <laughs> when we <laughs> on this field trip, we stopped at a McDonald's on the way back to school, to get which is abhorrent. No, she um, she told the teacher uh, it was really important that she got Sprite rather than like <laughs> water. Well, not, I guess rather than like a Coke or something at this, at this McDonald's this is a weird story uh, because she gave up dark soda. For Lent. That was, that was what she did. And I thought that was, I know I thought that was the strangest thing in the entire world, but that is how uh, I did learn about Lent. And um, I got to tell you, giving up, giving up dark soda. I mean, of all the things you could give up, it might as well be that. You can still drink Mountain Dew, and I think that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. A cool sort of workaround. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you're going to significantly increase that Baja Blast intake. Um, what's the weirdest thing you've ever given up for Lent? I mean, again, uh, being an evangelical, nothing, okay. ever. Barely ever. Um, every year, I would make the joke, I'm going to give up juggling watermelons mm. and get out of my life. Um, yeah, I don't know. What What about you, Dean? I've done it all. I've done all the regular stuff. Uh, I've done chocolates. I've done video games. I've done, you know, all the things you could possibly enjoy. Um, but uh, the weirdest one, <laughs> man, this is embarrassing to confess on the Internet, but I guess I'm going to do it. The weirdest one. Was, <laughs> you don't have to. No one's I, making you. No, I do have to because I've already started it. And we can't delete it. <laughs> That's the worst part about this podcast. Um, <laughs> I, when I was I, I must have been a, yeah, a freshman in college, which was like peak christian anarchist version of myself um i decided for lent i was gonna try to give up spending money on myself um as much as possible because the way i had worked it out was like i was living in a dormitory and i had like a meal plan at my college so i was like in theory i could not spend money for 40 days and like nothing bad would happen to me like i wouldn't die and like that would be that and it was um, not fun, I have to say. <laughs> not a good time. Um, all my friends would go do something fun, and I'd be like, well, sorry, I like can't go because I'm not spending money because um, that's my spiritual practice. And it was like tied up with bad ideas about dropping out of capitalism and reading too much Jane Claiborne at the time, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, the, the absolute worst part, this is the craziest thing. 
Um, so the person who is now my life partner, <laughs> she went on a date with me during that time. And uh, she did pay for our whole date because she respected my <laughs> Lenten fast. And uh, oh, no. anyway, I must be pretty charming because here we are still together. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that. That's great. Um, yeah. That's the episode of a reality dating TV show that we all really need. <laughs> Christian anarchist on a date but can't spend money because it's Lent is very funny. <laughs> yeah, there's 90 Day Fiance. There's uh, there's Love is Blind. Um, there also has to be uh, I was a teenage Christian anarchist. <laughs> All right. Oh, my God. That'll be the name Lifetime, of my... Uh, get at us. Yeah. <laughs> that'll be the name of my memoir. Um, okay. We've done it. We said we're not going to talk about the spiritual and the personal, and we're done. We're not doing it anymore. Now, we're doing the politics side. How's that for a transition? <laughs> We're probably going to do it <laughs> yeah. for sure again. Yeah. Okay. Here's the transition, though. So Matt and I are talking about Lent, and uh, Matt and I both have been just doing a lot of talking about Christianity and social movements and how to, I guess, make different Christian traditions and texts and things like that sort of operative or, like, make sense. And uh, we were fishing around for good Lenten stuff and came across the great old passage from Isaiah 58, about fasting. So since Lent is a tradition of fasting, I figured we could read this one out and kind of use it to orient some ideas around thinking through the political consequences of fasting or kind of the political contours of it. So let me read the Isaiah passage, and then we'll figure it out. So Isaiah 58 says, Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? So there you have it, folks. A great fasting passage that you can use to guide your Lent. Uh, it doesn't take a whole ton of work <laughs> to pull out the political stuff going on in here. But I got to say, uh, a powerful passage on fasting, uh, not the kind of thing I usually hear in my own kind of uh, Lenten journey. Yeah, you know, I think it rules because, I mean, when it does come to Lent, when it does come to things like fasting, um, it becomes a conversation about sort of like individual spirituality. It becomes like, you know, individual sort of discipline, disciplining your body, not eating or doing some other kind of practice or whatever. Um, but Isaiah 58 rules because just like, <laughs> sorry, no, not that. Fasting, that's not the one that we're about. We're about the one where we let people go free, where we free the prisoners, where, where we fight against injustice. And I'm all about that. That's so much... Um, I think so much more interesting, I think, than the sort of like individualistic fast of like, uh, <laughs> I'm only going to drink clear soda, but I am going to also <laughs> steal the wages from my workers or whatever. Uh, I, I think it's, um, it's such a, it's such a powerful word though. Um, and it's one that somehow we still lose uh, sight of in like regular spiritual practices within Christianity. And I think that is... I don't know. It boggles the mind why we ignore it so mm-hmm. <laughs> explicitly during the season in which we were supposed to fast. But here we are. Yeah. You know, I mean, this passage, the thing that I thought of right away in the beginning. Uh, so all the way back, he says, look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. And what I always think about is the McDonald's filet fish sandwich. Um, well, I don't know if this is true or apocryphal, but it is a very powerful Catholic rumor. I've heard it in more than one Catholic context that apparently the filet of fish exists because McDonald's wanted to like cash in on Catholics needing to eat fast food on Fridays during Lent. So they're like, here's a fish sandwich. Go nuts. Um, (laughs) But like (laughs) that can't be true, can it? I don't know who could say it's true for many Catholics in the world. I can tell you that whether or not it is actually true uh, in reality. But um I mean, nevertheless, uh, what's interesting to me about it is it's such the perfect example of something like this, like going to a McDonald's, um, eating a filet of fish. But meanwhile, like McDonald's workers are, you know, suffering and can't get real wages and are uh, abused more than (laughs) a lot of other workers. Um, Just kind of brings home for me that sort of uh, 
you know, serving your own interests on your fast day, uh, but also kind of not really attending. Not, so not like going to eat a fish sandwich. I'm not saying that's uh, <laughs> the equivalent here, but <laughs> let's say you're a McDonald's <laughs> franchisee owner, right? You, uh, totally. You're a guy who loves the filet of fish sandwich on a Friday um, and uh, maybe even a, a good, pious Catholic McDonald's franchisee owner. Um, but nevertheless, you know, you uh, yeah, your workers have to go on strike to get you to listen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great, a great example. Apocryphal or not, it's a good one. It drives the, the point home, right? That there's like this, um, there's a sense that when, we, when it comes to fasting, um, I mean, there's there's so much bound up with that word even, like so much weird um, body shaming ideas and lots of, lots of stuff with that, right? We can maybe talk about that in a minute or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but there is like this like weird, um, weird ideology of it where, you know, it's individualistic. It's something that you just do yourself and like, it's great for you. Um, but when you look to the Bible, when we're talking about fasting, we're, we're talking about something bigger than that. I think that's really worth, I don't know, considering, right. Um, if we're taking Isaiah 58 very seriously, as of course we are, uh, as great Bible believing Christians, Mm -hmm we can start asking ourselves very big questions like, you know, like what is, what does fasting look like today? Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Outside of, I mean, I think maybe cutting both ways, right. What is like the sort of like, um, sillier, I don't know, maybe silly is not the right word, (laughs) the less serious, like what is the, like, what does the individual fast look Mm -hmm. like? The one that's, uh, um, (laughs) it's like saying that you're, you're fasting, saying that you're engaging sort of spiritually with the world yet still exploiting other people. What does that look like? And then also the other the other direction, what does real fasting look like? What does it mean to um, free the oppressed or fight for the injustice? Um, uh, you know, what does it mean to untie the thongs of the yoke? What's it? What's a yoke in the first place? Maybe is a great question. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Isaiah 58 makes us ask um, a little bit deeper questions about the sort of nature of our of our fasting. I, I think that fasting is a really hard idea to think about because. I mean, capitalism has has screwed it up so deeply, right? Mm -hmm. Capitalism is totally happy to let people pursue individual types of fasting. And and, and, and in fact, like capitalist sort of systems will find ways to even like market and sell those types of fasting to you, um, either spiritual or otherwise too, right? I mean, Christianity has a a whole, like a a whole cottage industry around types of fasting. um, And and so does like, um, I don't know, like, fitness and sort of health, healthy living types of like weird capitalist niches, they, they sell fasting back to you in different ways. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, it's super gross. If you think about it, I'm taking something that's supposed to be a spiritual practice or whatever, and like selling it to you. uh, So you, I don't know, can feel worse about your body and feel like worse just in general, because you haven't eaten anything or whatever. It sucks. I think it's really bad. Capitalism, <laughs> I'm, I'm maintaining on this podcast here, going out on a limb here, <laughs> saying it's bad, continuing on to say it's bad. I'll never change my mind about that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess I'll have to say capitalism finds ways to incorporate like the individualistic types of fasting into its its logic of like exponential growth, right? Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that's what capitalism is about, growing. Capitalism doesn't work without growing. Um but real fasting, on the other hand, we can maybe kind of draw this out a bit here. Real fasting takes seriously the, I don't know, like the communal nature of fasting mm-hmm. or like the structural nature of fasting. I don't know how we want to work that out. But like it, it thinks of like this, it thinks of the fast in sort of a, a scope that's bigger than um, than just like something that you as an individual are doing. Like, you know, you choosing not to spend money during <laughs> lunch or whatever. <laughs> Right. So in that sense, um, when we think about fasting in terms of politics, in terms of injustice, in terms of like abolition, even um, especially with you know letting the oppressed go free, we think about uh, fasting as something that's like far more challenging because it actually works against that logic of accumulation and saying, you know, screw that stuff. <laughs> you don't need it. And actually, we can subvert some of those uh, systems of capital if we uh, if we think in these different sort of political ways. Yeah, I think, too, if we think structurally, it actually deepens the more personal fasting commitments that we take as well. Like, um, so, you know, (laughs) I was making fun of myself earlier for the the money fast. But uh, one thing that was actually very cool about it is fasting. You know, it's not just like an endurance thing. It's supposed to orient your mind and uh, your your heart or spirit or whatever to think about God, but also, I think, to think about the oppressed. That's a Lenten tradition as well, that you should be identifying with the poor. 
And uh, for instance, if you give up some kind of luxury, it's supposed to, you know, tip you off that, hey, did you know some people can't have that luxury even when it's not Lent ever because they're poor. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a sort of um, temporary, you know, voluntarily suspended moment where you can kind of be like, oh, okay, actually, you know, I can't just satisfy this craving whenever I want. And wouldn't that be a bummer? And I remember when I wasn't spending any money. Uh, I had that thought a lot of being like, (laughs) I wish I could do this thing, but I guess I can't because I can't spend money on it. And, you know, it's like those little reminders during the day. If you do have a a kind of more structural thing in mind, I think it can draw you more deeply into those struggles. But like it really depends on making that connection. Otherwise, Lent does become I mean, it's it's like (laughs) it can be such a weird neoliberal tradition (laughs) in a lot of ways. Right. It's just like about you kind of doing your spiritual thing with all your own personal responsibility and might to like work harder and like have this kind of heroic Christianity that can get through the suffering of it. And uh, I think it's important to always root that back in some kind of, even that personal piece in some kind of social recognition. Right. Yeah. That's actually a good point. I mean, I've been, um, I've been coming on pretty hard on the individual side of it. Right. (laughs) But I think that you're right to draw out the, that there is like sort of a a spiritual like trans like a, a spiritual idea on the other side that might you know be kind of individualistic in the sense that it changes the way that you think. But uh, it's worth saying it's it's worth pointing out though, right? That there's like a very shallow individualistic way of thinking about it, and then there's maybe like a deeper and like richer way to think about it as a sort of individual spiritual practice on the other side of uh, thinking about um, fasting politically. Yeah, I mean, it's like any spiritual technology. You engage in it because you want it to change you in some way or other. And you should want it to change you in a way that makes you commit to solidarity, I guess, with others instead of just be a good person in some vague, (laughs) abstract way. Um, Totally. But I think you're right, right? Nevertheless, all that being said, uh, it's way more fun to think about the political ramifications (laughs) because people don't do it as much. And uh, I find myself thinking about this kind of thing a lot. Like, how do you scale up? these Christian commitments that a lot of us are familiar with into uh, broader social consequences. Or it's like, if I'm committed to this idea that I should live simply, for example, during Lent, what would that mean if I wanted to live simply in kind of a, I don't know, like a bigger concentric circle, like thinking about the world around me. And I think there is a ton of ways of getting into that conversation. You know, we talk a lot about like structural change on this podcast, revolutionary change, transformational change, however you want to put it. And I think it is actually a really good opportunity to talk about Lent. Back in Advent, we were talking about the, you know, the revolutionary nature of love or something like that. And that is all very cool and very fun. And there's a kind of material piece of it for sure. But it can, I think (laughs) Advent lends itself maybe to being a little more, um, what's the word? Like a bit more spiritual, a bit more vague, a bit more abstract, I guess, is the word I want. Uh, Whereas Lent is like very concrete, right? Like very bodily And I think about that even with fasting, like what would it mean to kind of think in that bodily way? And there's so much conversation now about like the need to, especially in the global north, think about like massively decelerating our social like, (laughs) well, our society in every direction. Right. Decelerating Mm -hmm. our consumption, decelerating parts of our production. Um, And that is so counterintuitive to the way the world is organized right now. So Lent is like a good moment to be like what would it mean to sort of put the brakes on on all this stuff yeah you know um just as lent was beginning uh maybe a few days before uh a second the second part of the ipcc report came out about Mm -hmm. um climate change and that made me start thinking about some of these (laughs) some of these things um in all of their scary reality especially with regards to what you're saying the um i i mean i don't know that um the, the living simply part i guess because whether we like it or not, um, in one way or another, we'll have to figure that out. Like, um, <laughs> or, or I mean, or adapt in some kind of awful way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Either everyone will have to figure out how to live a bit more simply or we'll have to um, uh, embrace a world where some people have extreme luxury and other people have very little. Um Anyways, one one chunk of this uh, new IPCC report, the IPCC report, by the way, if you don't know, is just uh, it's a report from a bunch of scientists about global warming. Um, Let's see. uh, The big overview is that, like, basically, no matter what we do, whether we change the whole world right now or we don't, 
uh, the world will for sure get 1.5 degrees Celsius hotter. Um, and that's bad. <laughs> and if we don't do anything, it'll get, uh, you know, even hotter, two degrees, three degrees, I think like six or something is the worst. Maybe I'm wrong about that number, but all that say uh, the world will get hotter if we don't do anything. And that's kind of part of it. Anyways, another part of this, of the IPCC report that I thought was, I mean, really interesting and kind of goes along with what you're saying about living simply and kind of figuring out this like structural change part is that, um, well, okay, listen, um, climate change is, it makes the world hotter. Uh, it increases heat stress, not on, not, not just on people, but also like on, I don't know, things like crops and infrastructure. Uh, the heat is bad for all kinds of things. It makes water more scarce through droughts, which, you know, um, means less food security, which means, um, you know, more hungry people, <laughs> all kinds mm -hmm. of things, right? Um, not to mention other other, other types of, like, um, I, I guess, like the propensity for other types of natural disasters, like flood risks and I don't know, all kinds of other stuff. Um, anyways, all that to say that there's, like, a lot of these, like, um, challenges that climate change brings to the logic of capitalism like the the logic that um of exponential growth of of um you know getting bigger and bigger every year of producing more and more food because at a certain point you can't <laughs> you can't do it because climate change puts all that into question um and it it makes me think i don't know like uh, just just like you're saying right um living simply will have to become not just a spiritual practice, but it will have to become a real type of solidarity that I think all people on earth share, lest we uh, fall into something even worse, like, I don't know, eco-fascism or something. Yeah, I think that it's important for the left to take very seriously what that would mean for us as well, because it is a political reality, I mean, and a physical one and everything else, but it is also, I think, a bit of a spiritual reality too. Like, we talked about uh, Fry Beto's reflections on Cuba a long time ago, and uh, they're not right in front of me, but um, he has this great uh, article somewhere where he talks about Cuba being a, a project of spiritual discipline that like it takes oh, yeah. a lot of spiritual discipline in order to live in Cuba because you do have to like be patient and stand in line and like wait around for stuff sometimes. Um, you can't get necessarily everything that you want, but there's this understanding that all those sort of uh, all those inconveniences are piled up because you're contributing to the common good in light of, you know, being under siege. And that's very important. And it makes a certain kind of person. Uh, it creates a certain kind of populace. And there's there's a lot of spirituality involved in that, as opposed to the spirituality of capitalism, which is based on avarice and greed and makes you yucky and feel yucky and you're not part of anything and you're just, you know, fighting for it. And like, maybe the best case scenario is you get to buy whatever you want and like be happy. And uh, what a bummer. So I think it's important for the left to think about that because there is this spiritual dimension to what it would have to mean for especially global North societies to transition out of a capitalist growth economy and into something else. Like it would mean, really having to communicate to other people that we have to cultivate some sort of spiritual discipline that is okay with less, which is like not what you, not what you get in terms of our cultural messaging. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, that framing it as like living with less as a spiritual discipline is like a hard way to think about it. I think uh, for people, cause like, it, just like you said, it's not anywhere in our cultural messaging growth is everything, right? Even, even the the progressive woke Democrats are out there talking about how great it is that the economy is growing again or something. So like, you know, in, in nowhere is like living within our means or living simply within the conversation that people have culturally, I think, around, I don't know, living in general, right? You always want a bigger house. You always want whatever, a bigger car, uh, you know, a bigger Nintendo. I want I want the biggest one, <laughs> the biggest Nintendo. Um but uh, it's it's really hard to think in a different direction. Uh, you know, I've been reading um, I've been reading two things side by side, which I <laughs> are bizarre. They have nothing really to do with one another, but just kind of the way things work out. Um, I've been reading this book about the organizing strategy of Martin Luther King Jr., which is really fascinating. Um, and I've also been reading this book um, called Less is More by Jason Hinkle. And um, I, I promise the, the, this is going somewhere, not just two weird books I'm reading. Anyways, <laughs> the, the Martin Luther King Jr. book is really fascinating because it has a lot to say. He, he has a lot to say about scarcity and sort of the scarcity economy and the way that that's sort of self-created by capitalism. 
which is true in, in a certain way with thinking, but it's also a complicated idea. Um, but also, you know, his one of, one of the biggest talking points he, he has, I think that's really motivating to all the people that he was organizing, was that like, what if we had an economic system that actually cared about people rather than profits, which is like, you know, kind of like a, a trite sort of slogan, I think that is these days, right? Yeah, people before profits is like, just like a thing. <laughs> But I mean, like, I don't know if you think about what that actually means politically. I mean, it has to, it has to mean um, it has to mean living more simply. Right. It has to mean living in a world where we consume less so that other people can consume something at all, um, which I guess kind of um, dovetails into this other book. I was just mentioning the the book Less is More by Jason Hickel, which is a, a book about degrowth, which is a, a particular type of th- ecological theory that has a lot to do with politics. There's a lot going on with this book um, in particular, uh, but I like it a lot because it does challenge you to think about economics in a way that is counterintuitive um, for, the, I mean, the very reasons I was just saying, right, that everything within our cultural messaging is always about growth, job growth, GDP growth, um, the growth of productivity, the growth of wages, all of these things, right? Growth, growth, growth. It's through the roof. Uh, the, the, the thing that's really subversive about Hickel's book, uh, and about degrowth in general is that it's suggesting that like, maybe we're thinking about it wrong. Like maybe, um, maybe to, to do things like putting people before profits, we might have to think about growth. Like is, is growing productivity for the sake of productivity or growing the economy for the sake of the economy or even growing jobs for the sake of jobs? Is that like really a growth worth having? Is that a growth that does something for us? Um, and I think that's a pretty cool idea, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's also helpful to bring that into conversations on the left too, because I think that, I don't know, there's sometimes you see certain discourse, uh, where people will be like, we want infinity pools for everybody, you know, like right. <laughs> socialism Luxury is about, based communism. Yeah, exactly. It's about expanding, uh, a consumerist lifestyle uh, to everybody and convincing people that like you don't have to give anything up to be a socialist. We just, you know, the rich have to give it up and then it will all come down to all of us. And then we'll all be, you know, drinking champagnes in our personal hot tubs in our like one bedroom apartments or whatever. And I think it is really a dangerous rhetoric to kind of spread that around because it creates like unreal expectations for everybody, right? Like that kind of world is literally not possible. We couldn't like, uh, I forget what the statistic is, but the amount of planet earths we would need for like everybody to, uh, consume in the way that the United States could consume is a lot. I mean, it's more than one, so it's already a lot, (laughs) but it's many more than one. It's, uh, you know, like it's, it's literally not possible to expand those consumptive patterns. It is the peak of, of human consumption and it needs to like go down <laughs> if, if we're going to do anything at all uh, with everybody in the planet. And I, I don't know, it's just, it's good to bring the degrowth kind of idea into conversation on the left, because that is really what the global North has to do. It has to uh, decrease um, if there's going to be any kind of justice in the world. Yeah, that's right. You know, a few years ago, there was a really popular book called Inventing the Future by Nick Surichuk and Alex Williams. Um, it was like a cool, a cool graphic designed um, verso book. And like, I think there are some things that are in it that are really interesting and pretty good. Um, I mean, the whole book is sort of focusing on automation and um, and like a, a guaranteed income and, you know, socialism, <laughs> those three things. Which are cool, but part of the assumption in the book is that, like, well, no one's going to ever get on board to socialism if um, they have to give up sort of the consumptive lifestyle. And I feel like that, on the one hand, like, I guess maybe that's true, or at least it does ring true in some senses in the way, because, because consumption is such a pervasive ideology. It's such a hard thing to, like, really, I don't know, how do you get people to stop buying things? It's very difficult. Um, so, I mean, there's probably some truth to it, but also like it is untenable though. (laughs) It is like, uh, it is, uh, to have a, to have a type of socialism that can functionally deal with ecological collapse. It it just like, you can't, you can't have the consumptive, you can't have the same consumptive patterns. Just, it just does not Mm -hmm. work. And I don't know. I mean, I guess that's too bad, but I think it's probably (laughs) the truth. Um, so uh, let me talk more about this Jason Hickel book. I, I have a good mm-hmm. quote from it that might kind of help frame some of like what's happening or like maybe some of the some of the I don't know weight behind the argument. 
So Hickel says that this, uh, Hickel says this, nearly a third of all the labor we've rendered, all the resources we've extracted, and all the CO2 we've emitted over the past half century has been done to make rich people richer. Once we realize that we don't need growth, we are free to think much more rationally about how to respond to the crisis that we face, the crisis being ecological destruction and collapse. Scientists have made it clear that the only feasible way to reverse ecological breakdown and keep global warming under 1.5 Celsius 1.5 cel- degrees cel- 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius is for high income countries to actively slow down the mad pace of extraction, production and waste. Um he goes on to say a little bit later, this is what we call degrowth, a planned downscaling of energy and resource use a planned downscaling of energy and resource use to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a safe, just and equitable way. Um, we've talked about this, I think, as an idea on the ep- on, on the podcast before. I don't think we've ever used the phrase degrowth, or maybe we have, maybe we haven't. It's it's, it's anyone's guess. But there is this <laughs> other kind of uh, phrase that we've talked about from a, a guy named John Bellamy Foster, um, the ecological rift, right? This this idea of, like, balance and um, the ways that humans have to have sort of a balanced relationship with the uh, with ecology, because if you don't, I mean, like, you can't live, right? Once those th- two things get out of whack, um, you end up having these, like, pretty large-scale problems like climate change and, and whatnot. But all that to say, I think this is a really helpful – I mean, I mean, if, if we want to think about the, the idea of fasting or the idea of living simply, like, these big Lenten themes, to me, like, this is where my brain goes kind of automatically because – um, you know, we, we want to think about what, what does it mean to, to, to fast for injustice? What does it mean that we want to, like, free people from types of oppression to undo the thongs of the yoke, right? What does it mean? And, and I think it has to mean structurally dealing with the patterns of consumption in the world. Because if we don't, I mean, we have, I don't know, we're, we're facing uh, mass migrations of people as they flee from um, places that are no longer livable. Right. And I mean, just to bring back the Isaiah stuff, right? Uh, Isaiah asks sort of rhetorically, um, is uh, is it fasting if you just like are humble and put your head down and look like you're having a big bummer? Um, <laughs> is that like what you think a fast is? Uh, and then he says, you know, no, the fast is to lose the bonds of injustice, undo the yokes of oppression and so on, right? Um, and uh, like we talked about in the, the Jubilee episode, that's also the kind of uh, tradition that Jesus sees himself in, right? That prophetic moment of calling a, a jubilee um, into being that has those themes too. And uh, those themes of, you know, letting the oppressed go free, um, all that kind of stuff, announcing the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, and then maybe in this case, announcing kind of what the, uh, <laughs> what fast is acceptable to God. It's not the fast of kind of, you know, giving up just the dark soda and no shade to that uh, young lady <laughs> but uh you know a uh, a fast that actually could recognize um we need to fast so that other people can live or you know the thing you get in some movement spaces at least the ones that i'm in uh living simply that so that others can simply live i think that's really important you know it doesn't just come down to our consumptive habits or consumptive patterns for sure but on a collective scale it does come down to exactly that <laughs> all all of us need to consume less all at the same time yeah, you know, that's actually the first thing I thought of. Um, I saw Joe Biden. He got his ashes the other day. And um, I was thinking about uh, <laughs> Joe Biden and his great his great smudged forehead, uh, but then also how he did sell off a ton of public land right. <laughs> in the Gulf of Mexico. And weapons. Yeah, and weapons, sure, of course, both um, – completely i don't know it, it's just it's exactly like isaiah right this this dude who's uh he's gonna put the he's gonna put the ashes on but uh not really do anything about it not really do anything right. meaningful and um and and let a bunch of people die and have awful awful lives because uh i don't know he doesn't want to do it yeah i think that's bad that's my hot take on that one it sucks i hate it yeah well i think uh you know Talking about degrowth is great. Uh, one thing that I always think about when I think about degrowth, too, is the ecological movement and what's going on there. Um, people have been talking about the Green New Deal for the last several years now, um, long enough that it's like old news, I guess. Uh, but there's a great book out last year, I guess, 2021, um, called The Red Deal, which is a playoff of the Green New Deal. And they have a really interesting angle on all this kind of stuff. So it's still kind of analysis. It started as a manifesto document and then got expanded for this book version. 
and it comes out of indigenous liberation movements. And it's really an interesting dialogue with contemporary movements around capitalism, degrowth, ecology, all that kind of stuff. But the key is to sort of root it in land back and decolonization and indigenous struggle in general. And I mean, I read it like in the fall, I guess. And I come back to it a lot because it is very simple. And the whole sort of thrust of it, I guess, or the, you know, the key point is like all the struggles that we think are so important, whether it's prison abolition or ecology or whatever, they're all connected. And they're especially connected to ideas we have around land and extraction and colonization. And if we want to undo those things, it takes uh, not just degrowth, but decolonization. Uh, You know, these are all kind of things that are like of a piece. And I think it's so important to pull that in, uh, especially when we're talking about even things like fasting from all this stuff. Like, I don't know, there are other spiritual traditions that have thought a lot more productively (laughs) in a positive sense or uh, a lot more effectively, I guess, is maybe a better adjective. Um, about how to live in harmony with the planet, right? And uh, it has to do with really finding those rhythms and relationships and not uh, consuming whatever you want, whenever you feel like it. And I think, I don't know, seeing that kind of indigenous-led movement as the the one way of uniting a lot of these threads has been a really good organizing principle, at least for me, thinking through that political stuff. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, I was actually just really recently learning about uh, an indigenous struggle in Arizona. Uh, at a a piece of land called Oak Flats. Man, I'd never known about it before, which I think is really bonkers. In 2014, well, actually, let me take another step back. Eisenhower, <laughs> that president. I heard of him. Familiar. Dwighty. Yeah, he, um, so he forcibly removed Apache, like the Apache tribe from this land in Arizona and it for like development, uh, industrial development and whatnot. Um, and that's bad. We can all recognize how that's bad, I think. Um, and then like, as sort of like a, uh, I don't know, as some way to save face or, or to show that he wasn't all bad, he did preserve like a small a small portion of it, which were really important to the Apache people. It had sort of spiritual significance, right? Um, fast forward a bunch of years to 2014 when John McCain um, on, on a military budget bill tacked on this bit about the um, the development of this land that is is still unceded <laughs> Apache territory in Arizona. Uh, that that um, over the course of years, it would go toward the it, it would just be like kind of passed over to this mining company and there's nothing anyone can really do about it. And it sort of like subverts federal law and all these kinds of things. Anyways, um, all that to say, uh, I've been um, there was a recent sort of like march around it a few weeks ago and listening to some of the words and some of the stories about that. And it is, it's, I don't know, extremely apparent to me that. Um, that these that these struggles are really interconnected, mm-hmm. right? That um, we, we can't just keep passing off land to mining companies. I mean, it should have never happened in the first place, <laughs> but um, it definitely shouldn't have shouldn't happen now. John McCain, you <laughs> suck. <laughs> I don't like you. Uh, I probably have some stronger words, actually. But anyways, um, I think that you're you're right to draw these connections. I mean, you're not. The <laughs> you're book yeah. about it. <laughs> But uh, Nick Estes is right to do it, <laughs> and the the red the red deal collective is is right to do it. I think that makes a lot. Of yeah, sense. I think too. I mean, thinking also about indigenous solidarity and degrowth is helpful too because uh, you you were just mentioning that situation in Arizona. You know, in Canada, uh, there's all kinds of stuff happening with the pipeline out in Wet'suwet'en territory, obviously, which is premised on growth, but more closer to where I am in Ontario, there's a big sort of I don't know, long brewing face off between the government and um, some First Nations groups in northern Ontario in what the what the government calls the ring of fire. Um, But uh, it is I don't know, like it's like uh, on their website. I was looking at it today because I was uh, just reading some calls to action on their website. They say that it is like one of the most promising mineral development opportunities for like critical minerals, as they call it. I don't know what they are, but there's a lot of uh, mining in Ontario generally. And anyway, so they want to mine this particular area or allow mining companies to do it, private companies, uh, just to have access to it. And it is really wild because they were supposed to enter into this um, dialogue with the First Nations peoples there. And as you can guess, it has not gone well. Um, And uh, there's all kinds of different things happening. But what's really wild is like, 
the First Nations people there call it the breathing lands more generally rather than the Ring of Fire. Mm. And it matters, especially with the growth stuff, because I don't know, like, yes, does the world need minerals? Do our economies need minerals? Do our consumer goods need them? Yeah. But like, I don't know, maybe we just like need less stuff also. Like (laughs) if we all decided that we don't need like a new iPhone every year, maybe we could like get less lithium out of Bolivia or something, you know, like all these different kinds of struggles are connected to even our regular consuming habits and things like that. And Like I said, it's not down to like our personal consumer choice, but like it is down to how we have decided to organize our lives in a collective way, um, at least in kind of a crowd logic way for the benefit of rich people and for like, I don't know, pretty arbitrary luxuries on our part in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, okay, we need minerals for consumer goods, I guess. Sure. Um, could we have less? Yes, yeah, so of course. But but also, like, I don't know, you have to recognize, too, the ways that capitalism contains all kinds of very silly contradictions within itself. Like, it's so effective. It's so efficient. It makes cool things like the iPhone. But at the same time, it also makes the iPhone, which, like, you know, is obsolete right. after so long. On purpose. <laughs> it has sort of a manufactured. Yeah, on purpose. Right. So it's so it, capitalism is so efficient that it can create iPhones that, like, will break soon. Like, so I don't know. Yeah. Maybe the the degrowth answer is like the socialist iPhone that, <laughs> right, that, right. that will last, that will last forever. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, well, degrowth is such an interesting and complicated thing because, like, on the one hand, um, I don't know. Like, scarcity is something that is created and that is enforced by capitalism, right? Like, the reason that there are 140 million, I don't know, poor and low wage working people in the United States is because capitalism necess- necessarily makes it that way, right? It, it keeps people from uh, certain amounts of money. Um, it, it necessitates that some people are just going to be out of work because, like, it has to. That's just the way capitalism works as a system. Yeah. And that scarcity is, like, made up, I think, right? Like, everyone everyone could have enough money if they wanted to. Everyone could have food if they wanted to. That's all possible. This, th- that type of scarcity is, is mm-hmm. fake. Resources could, of course, be distributed more equally, so scarcity doesn't exist at all, and that would be cool. But to do that, I mean, to get to that point, right, not everyone could consume at the same levels of people in North America. It's just, like, mm-hmm. not possible. Scarcity, on the one hand, um, is fake, and it is constructed by people that want it to exist, by, like, wealthy people. Politicians, they're in, their, they're in the mix, too. They're bad. They're not off the hook. But, like, to overcome scarcity would mean that consumption would have to change, that uh, fundamentally we'd have to live in the world differently. And I think that, like, the, the moral point to all of this is that, like, there is enough for everyone, but also everyone should consume less, right? <laughs> like, we should find ways structurally around that. Yeah. So I I don't know. I I mean, fasting becomes this like very fasting when we think about it in in terms of structure. Right. And we're we're thinking of ecology. We're thinking of the economy. Um, Degrowth seems like a really helpful way to get our mind around like what that might look like. Right. But it it means that like we have to do things significantly different. Right. You know, it's funny. So I work for Development and Peace. Catholic organization in global solidarity here in Canada. And uh, we are kind of going through this process of like thinking about our next steps as an organization and then all that kind of stuff. And it's been really interesting to follow that process, uh, especially because our name is complicated, right? Development and peace. Um, It comes out of a papal encyclical uh, where the Pope said that development is a new name for peace in the sixties. And uh, that's all very interesting. But the term development obviously has um, a lot of stuff loaded into it. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Development according to who, who's doing the development, developing in what way and for whose purposes and all that kind of stuff. Those are questions that aren't answered in that one word, right? And development discourse has often meant uh, capitalist development and so on. So anyway, development of peace has been very aware of all that conversation for a long time, but we've had this name for over 50 years. So what are you going to do? So one way that uh, some of the literature that I've been just reading is talking about it is to say uh, it's not actually just the global south that has to develop, but also the global north that has to develop in such a way that is like an integral uh, relationship between the global north and the south. One that is, you know, uh, mutual and not a matter of like, oh, there are there's the developed world and then the non-developed or underdeveloped world, but rather, you know this kind of uh, equalization of relationships. And I actually really liked that way of splitting the difference of being like, um, you know, (laughs) the global North is actually severely underdeveloped when it comes to like 
uh, our own spiritual resources or like our ability to be in solidarity with others, which like the global South yeah. has in abundance, <laughs> you know, um, right. and uh, our, our basic moral yeah. thinking, like we have none of exactly. It. So being able to kind of also think about that uh, in light of degrowth stuff that actually like we have to maybe grow in some other ways, <laughs> you know, degrow in the material way and uh, grow a lot more in uh, moral or, or kind of spiritual ways. I think, uh, you know, maybe at the very end here, one thing that is so fascinating about fasting as a tradition is it's kind of one of those weird Christian ideas that has this goofy paradoxical logic in it where it's like if you give something up, then you'll get something kind of tenfold, right? If you give up a material good or material luxury, then you'll gain this kind of spiritual wisdom or spiritual insight or whatever that is, you know, rich beyond riches and so on. And I think that can be pathological and very bad and dangerous, obviously, in lots of ways. But uh, I think that also experientially, if you do it in a healthy way, it is true, right? When you kind of when you're able to give something up and it it kind of directs your attention toward the poor and toward God, it does encourage you to, I guess, have a richer life um, in that way. And I think maybe that's how I feel about the political piece of this, too. Right. If we were all to sort of give something up, we'd probably get a lot back Um 10 times over, but it, it really is difficult to like break that addiction to uh, capitalism, the addiction to consumption, all that kind of stuff. So maybe that that's my Lenten dream this time around is I'm going to try to give up as much capitalism as possible and just see what I get. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast or don't. Maybe you've given up Patreon for Lent. That's fine. But don't give up rating us on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, take that one on board you can do that if you've never done it that's right that's the Lenten practice that you can add is giving us a review that would be great our intro music is by Amari Armstrong our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon and we'll see you next time I don't want to get up for church in the morning church in the morning souls alive heaven come to earth and there won't be no church we'll meet down by the riverside they will swim with all creation, never get tired, never bored, don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, you keep your hoods up, you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late. Jackson, you keep your hoods up. Where you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early. At least I.